receiving these notifications and posting them, reviewing them, posting them to the website, as well as providing local assistance to agencies, helping them get to the finish line. And I see, I'm sure you guys have had, um, uh, you guys have been a part of our uh, outreach, our uh, public assistance with uh, some of our representatives from our southern region office, uh, as well as David Gutierrez coming out here from our headquarters, um, providing uh, that kind of assistance. Now, the alternative plans, probably not terribly applicable to this region. Um, those are going to be due on January 1st. Recently, we, we our portal, our web portal went live on December 2nd, which makes it uh, accessible to local agencies to submit their alternative plans via the web. So getting right into it, the best management practices. Um, the act really wasn't terribly prescriptive in what uh, the best management practices uh, are or need to be. Uh, that gave DWR a significant amount of flexibility to do um, uh, different, different things with this project. The text in the technical assistance, uh, the, the, techni the technical assistance text in the act uh, says that only that we needed to publish BMPs by January 1st of 2017 and have four public meetings to support those, uh, those BMPs, those draft BMPs, uh, which we did wrap up in November of this year. So the, getting into the BMPs, we see the BMPs as technical assistance. These are technical documents to provide clarification or examples to aid stakeholders in the development of groundwater sustainability plans <coughs> and the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. The BMPs are not requirements. They are guidance and are encouraged but remain optional for local agencies. Now the content in these BMPs um, provide um, providing these documents does not create any new requirements for or obligations for GSAs or local stakeholders. There are two caveats, however. Uh, the GSP re uh, regulations do require that agencies develop their own BMPs or adopt DWR's BMPs for monitoring protocols and the installation of monitoring networks. Now we think that, that BMP development is an ongoing project. We, um, we will meet our January 1st deadline of submitting the five uh, final BMPs uh, to the California Water Commission. Uh, however, we do plan on amending these documents uh, in the future. Perhaps we did not address all of the, the subject matter in, in enough detail. Maybe additional BMPs need to be uh, included. Now, instead of going to uh, public meetings we, uh, and explaining how uh, we can provide assistance to complete a groundwater sustainability plan, we are hoping that these uh, will be our technical manuals for the local agencies. We want to, uh, we want to be able to uh, go to uh, public meetings, sit down with the, with, the, with the local agencies, and talk about specifics relating to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and best management practices. Now, the type of information that we, that we used to, to prepare these best manager practices, much of it uh, was uh, existing, existing uh, uh, studies, standards, uh, case studies. Uh, a lot of good information and case studies are out there. And uh, we hope to have our website as a central hub for these case studies and, and, and uh, other materials, existing standards, um, and supporting references for the BMPs. Now, the first document that uh, I'm going to get into that was published, uh, it was a draft document recently published in October, is our draft BMP framework. This four-page document uh, is available on our website. The document explains how BMPs work together to support GSP development. Um, this, it, it talks about how to utilize the BMPs and the limitations that these BMPs have. It also discusses uh, the BMP, how the BMPs fit together uh, in terms of progression to support GSP development. Now, uh, what I mean by this is uh, this di diagram here. 
Um, the BMPs and guidance documents are organized to follow a logical progression to Sigma compliance activities. We have the outreach, critical component, and uh, re a regulatory requirement. Uh, basin setting, also a regulatory requirement and critical to understanding uh, the planning of a, of a GSP. Then we have the planning uh, portion of the uh, groundwater sustainability plan. And of course, the, the, the projects and management actions. And then lastly, the monitoring. Now the monitoring is one of the more important components of the GSP. This is what the agencies are going to be using to, to manage those sustainability indicators. How are the basins, how are the agencies uh, uh, achieving sustainability? Oops, I'm sorry. Back really quick. Um, now, if you were to summarize the major components that need to be addressed, it would look something like this. What this diagram shows is, is the five BMPs uh, that we've released as draft. Um, they shown, they're shown as bullets here on, on the diagram. Uh, the monitoring protocols, monitoring networks and identif identification of data gaps, uh, modeling, and the hydrogeologic conceptual model, and the water budget. Now, at the same time, we put out two guidance documents, uh, a, a checklist, uh, which will be uh, which can be used for uh, GSP compliance and an annotated outline. Now I'll get a little bit more into these in a later slide, uh, so don't worry about that. Now as you can see by the items shown with an asterisk, there, we do have some items that are still in development. Um, these items are still being worked on by the department and we anticipate them being out um, later in, in 2017, if not by the end of the year. The I'm sorry. The asterisks are at the, the bottom there. There's the, uh, the engagement with tribal engagement with tribal governments, okay. the Thank sustainable you. engagement and communication. Uh, those are two guidance documents, and then there's the um, where is it the the establishing uh, sustainable management criteria. So we're still working on those, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into those in, in just a, a moment. <clears throat> Now the tentative schedule uh, that we're looking at, some of this isn't tentative anymore. Uh, October 20, 28th has come and passed, um, come and gone. And so we have uh, su submitted those, those draft BMPs to the Water Commission. They are available to the public for review. Um, they, uh, w w we still are working on those guidance, guidance documents on the bottom. Uh, that I had just uh, mentioned. Um, we have, we have the, uh, the engagement with tribal governments. Um, we're still working on this guide, guidance doc document. We are working with our tribal policy advisor to develop guidance on how do, how do tribal governments expect to be engaged during the GSA and GS and process and uh, developing their GSP. We are interested in getting this complete in early 2017 or by the probably closer to the end of the year, I'd say. We are also working on a guidance documents for stakeholder engagement and communication, as well as establishing stain water, uh, sustainable management criteria, which we anticipate being released in early 2017. Now, establishing the state sustainable uh, management criteria, this is, a, this is one of those things in the, in the uh, regulations uh, that we recognize was was a, was the hardest part to address and write into a sustainability plan. This looks at uh, how to address address the undesirable results, how to look at and establish minimum thresholds and uh, minimum objectives. Uh, so these are things that, that we felt were that, that were going to be a challenge both to the the, the sustainability agencies. Uh, to to get into their sustainability plans and for us to actually articulate in a uh, BMP. So we save them for a guidance document. Uh, this allowed us to uh, to use graphics such as flow charts, um, which were not um, uh, allowed by by the by the regulations to be included in the best management practices. So getting into the BMPs, uh, we have five BMPs, like I, I mentioned earlier. The first BMT gets into monitoring protocol. Uh, this, guide, this document is designed to guide local agencies on how to collect data in a consistent manner. Uh, it, 
it deals with standardization, uh, which will assist in collecting consistent data across basins, multiple basins, or even the state. Um, this will assist in, in monit monitoring the sustainability indicators, uh, which are uh, regulatory requirements, and, uh, the, and the avoidance of the undesirable results. Now, I, I would say this probably isn't, I'm sorry, back here. Back. This probably isn't terribly applicable to uh, this region. It's my understanding there's, a, there's quite a robust monitoring network out here um, that uh, this BMT probably is, is not going to be much of a concern for um, this, this agency as you move forward with developing your, your own water sustainability plan. Can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. Why, how do you, why do you make that statement? Um, it was just an understanding that, that I had from uh, some of our resources. Uh, okay, I'm just curious where you got that information. Mr. Pocket, do you agree with that statement? Um, I think, yes, relative to the other basins in the state, uh, this, this has a pretty uh, good monitoring network. We, we do need to do a little more work in the southwest portion of the basin on the other side of uh, Highway 14 where we don't have a lot of information. Okay. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at that aerial electromagnetics as a beginning. Thank you. And that's actually uh, a, a, good, um, a, a good segue into... Uh, uh, best management practices too, um, uh, and that that looks at addressing the data gaps and um, the mon and setting up monitoring networks and identifying the data gaps. Now this uh, this BMP is not terribly prescriptive because basin size and basin conditions can dictate um, um, different different uh, scenarios. So so it's really this BMP really looks at the spatial distribution uh, of monitoring wells. It provides guidance on how to approach the requirements of minimizing the data gaps and coming up with the right spatial distribution and correct frequency of monitoring and data collection. So I'm going to, I think my slide here is out of order. So there we go. So going into best management practices three, this is a hydrogeologic conceptual model. Uh, now this model, is, this is a really important part of uh, the best management practices and part of the, the um, groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, it's the basis for establishing an understanding of the basin setting, which is a regulatory requirement. It is important because a, a lot of additional technical information branches from this uh, hydro hydrogeologic understanding. How a model is set up, um, how undesirable results are determined, and uh, monitoring networks, how, mon how monitoring will be established. And the water budgets, how will water budgets be determined and achieved? And then uh, lastly, but certainly not least, and stakeholder outreach and engagement. The fourth BMP has to do with water budgets. Now, one thing I wanted to point out uh, is that with um, these BMPs, within each BMP there is a uh, fundamental section that gets into describing what the BMP is about, talking about terms and and, but, but for this specific uh, BMP, the fundamental section is quite longer than the other uh, uh, BMPs. And this is simply to explain a lot of the terms and, and understandings of what a, what a water budget is about. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, misconceptions about what, what water budgets are. So this goes into talking about the inflows, the outflows, what, change, what constitutes change in storage, what what uh, contributes to change in storage, gets into the specific re regulatory requirements uh, that account for sustainable yield of the basin. It also talks about how to approach a water budget from a tabular standpoint or a graphical standpoint. And it also gets into how to define current, historic, and projected water budgets. Now our last BMP is, uh, is uh, has to do with modeling. Uh, this BMP gets into the fundamentals of modeling and really connects why, um, why monitoring is so important to, to uh, producing hydrologic models. Uh, it gets into the regulatory significance of, of, of modeling and how it plays into your groundwater sustainability plan and the different softwares and different models used throughout the state. Um, 
it also addresses the issue of, of proprietary models, which uh, did come up uh, with, through, uh, during the development of the GSP uh, regulations. It gives some guidance, uh, some guiding, pr guiding principles on how to continue using proprietary models. Um, now, we understand that, that locals have these models that they're already using, and they've already invested millions of dollars into these models. So there's no sense in requiring them to, to spend more money to develop a, a, another model to perhaps mo monitor or model the same exact information. So we, there is some flexibility in this, however, there, with, with using these. However, there is one caveat, and that is that if if a model, if a proprietary model was used, uh, developed after, um, I believe it was January 1st, 2015, um, it is not, uh, a local agency cannot use that. So proprietary, proprietary models need to be established prior to January 1st, 2015 in order to be uh, used as part of this um, regulation. And lastly, the, the BMP also gets into the uses of a groundwater, groundwater model, uh, addressing and identifying the, the sustainability ad indicators and how those might turn into undesirable results. Uh, it aids in the development of water budgets as well as uh, assessing impacts to adjacent basins. I'm sorry, I should have clicked through this. So the, the last uh, two items that I'm going to talk about uh, that we published in draft form are the, uh, are the checklist. The, prep the preparation checklist for GSP submittal and the GSP annotated outline. Uh, these both are available on our website. Um, the checklist, very simple document. Uh, it's meant to uh, really lay out all the regulatory requirements so um, agencies can really just go down a checklist, make sure they've hit all the marks before they submit their groundwater sustainability plan for um, review by the department. And also we have a, an annotated outline, which is basically an outline of a groundwater sustainability plan. Now it's not something that we require. This isn't our preferable format, and we would, ex we would accept um, GSPs in, in, in any format um, that, that the locals deem um, appropriate for them. Uh, this is merely meant as a, as a guidance document um, and can be used as such. So next, next steps. Uh, well, we've wrapped up our public meetings for our, um, for, for our best management practices. And the public comment period for the best management practice, practices did recently uh, wrap up uh, in the beginning of December. So our next step is to publish our final BMPs. And we, we will do that before the end of December. So the future of DWR and Sigma engagement. Moving beyond phase one. Now phase one is the GSA formation and, and looking at what activities went into uh, the development of the GSA. Um, local agencies still have a lot of work to do. Now, I, now understandably, uh, you, uh, this, this region has done a, a lot of legwork and it's coming to fruition today. Um, but a lot of agencies, a lot of basins throughout the state, there, 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 st there's still a lot of uh, work to do. Heavy lifts ahead for for many for many basins. So we're here to support that. We we're here in a, a, a an assistance role. We're here to provide assistance, and get these agencies to the finish line successfully. Um, we are uh, looking ahead to phase two of the GSP. Uh, which would involve GSP preparation and submission. For this, we see four activities that will assist in the GSP development. Planning assistance, uh, which again, uh, working with your regional offices um, to get your, your uh, sustainability agency established. Uh, GSP compliance. Uh, we want to have the technical discussions, spread out our BMPs on the table, and have a dialogue. We do not want uh, GSAs to go away work on their GSP and then come back in 2020 or, or 2022 with their plan and say, well, here we have, here we have it. We, we want to be part of that process, make sure that uh, agencies are staying on course. 
So um, that is going to be part of our role as a department and, and providing technical assistance and, GS, and with, that, with GSP compliance. Another role of uh, technical assistance <clears throat> is going to be providing uh, the best available ba data sets for, for GSP development. Um, how can, and how can we provide those data sets? And lastly, the last arm of our assistance is our financial assistance. Uh, Prop 1, uh, approved by the voters, uh, provided $100 million for the groundwater sustainability plan. $86 million of that is still on the table. And this, this is money that is available to agencies such as um, the, the future uh, groundwater sustainability agency here uh, as seed money to develop your groundwater sustainability plan. So we're not letting you go this alone. We're, we're putting this out there. The, the voters approved it. This, we see this as a necessary component to really getting those sustainability plans uh, achieved and successfully. Now in 2020, we will transition into more of a regulatory role. We will be reviewing your groundwater sustainability plans and making sure they, they are compliant. They meet the regulations and they meet what, what was established in the legislature. So lastly, I just want to close with this. We, we're here, we, we, want, we want agencies to be successful. We're, we're, we're here to get, get the agencies to the, the, the end, the finish line, June 30th for the GSA, for establishing your GSA, and, and even beyond that with the GSP development. It's a, I, we will be successful if you are successful. So that's all I have for you today. If you have any comments, questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to do my best to answer them. I do have my pen and paper here because I anticipate I will not be able to answer all your questions. Thank you, Brian. Grab a seat. We may have a question for you. Good. Okay. Um, I, I have a question. Please. Okay, Brian, don't go yet. Go um, the, um, so you have money to, to, to help, and how, how, do you, how do you expect to distribute that money? Is, are, is it all going to be grants to, as agencies um, develop, or there no, no, uh, no kind of a reward system or anything like that? It will be. It, it, the, the Prop 1 funds were a designated grant program, a competitive grant program. So they will be distributed more than likely in one to two um, solicitations. So, um, you know, look for that. Uh, th there is no there is no reward system. It's you know, the reward actually is getting your your GSA established. You know, that puts you in the driver's seat to, to get these funds. So okay. that's the motivation there. Get your GSA established so you make yourself accessible to these funds. Mr. Brown. Yep. Um, on your technical assistance, you mentioned something about managing data sets. Um, could you expand on that just a little bit? Managing data sets. Is that the state data sets? Yeah. You know, we're still working on, on you know, getting those together. Uh, that's part of our technical assistance, and it's part of our technical assistance arm that we're we're working to to establish. Um, I haven't heard a lot on, on what data sets will be made available, um, but we see that as a critical component uh, yeah. to to getting um, to helping these agencies move towards their, their groundwater sustainability plans. Are you uh, one more question, if I could? Sure. Are you looking at some kind of way of um, uh, making it a, a uniform reporting system? I know that was probably in your on another slide earlier, but. Everybody has compiled their information in so many different ways. Uh, and, I, and I can see where you have your modeling uh, mandate on the 15 or 2015 and stuff, but um, it's all about the data in the sure. end. I mean, that's, that's the key to everything. So I was just curious. Well, and that's where the, the, consist, uh, uh, the monitoring um, protocols were, are being uh, put in place. You know, or, I'm sorry, the, the data standards. We, we have specific data standards that are being established in these BMPs. Now, um, as far as submitting to the state, my guess is is that, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I can't say 100%, uh, but we have, um, we have traditionally gone to a, a web portal type submission system um, with a lot of our 
our, our submissions. So my guess is that would be the route we would go, which would, you know, you know the, the standardization would likely follow. Ms. Breeden. I think I understood you to say early on in your report that you we would develop the monitoring protocols. Could you explain that, how we would develop it? Are you looking at it to meet some standards, or do we develop our own and say, here it is? Well, uh, as I indicated, um, the monitoring protocols, um, they are a legislative requirement. Requirement, um, whether you follow your own best management practices or the best management practices laid out by the state, they need to be. I guess my answer is: you could either develop your own best management practices for the monitoring protocols, or you can use our best management practices. So, the option would be up to the, the, the agency uh, how they want to move forward. In that. How do you value our, if we were to do it ourselves, how do you value that? Is there a criteria that you're looking for? I'm trying to understand if we, either, because sometimes things that you set out are standard and are good for everybody, but there are some exceptions. Do we have to meet those exceptions or do we have the opportunity to say, this is what we are? This is how we are doing it. Are you going to come back and say, no, you haven't met this? I'm trying to understand how we develop our own. What criteria do we use to develop our own rather than take something that may not fit us? That's a good question. I don't know if I have quite the answer for you. Um, we, we do have certain, there, there are going to be data standards. Um, and those would be perhaps your, your starting point to guide to um, developing your <clears throat> your BMPs for monitoring protocols. Um, you know, I can look further into this for you and and get a better answer. Apologize, I don't ha I don't have a. Uh, well, it is something you're just now doing. It's not uh, like you've done it a million times. Right. Maybe I can help. I bet you can. Excuse uh, me. So excuse, me excuse me. Hold on for a second. All conversation comes through me. So if you wanted it, would oh, Ms. Paco, go ahead and speak. That's okay. Me too. That's oh, I, I think I can help a little bit. So I think we, for now, we look at their uh, their BMP as the standard we're going to look to um, meet. And we look at that, and then we evaluate whether or not we can meet that standard with the existing practices. And if we can, then we're done. And if we can't, then we have to uh, we have to look a little further into it. And I'll, I'll, I'll look further into you know, our, our evaluation of that as well and get an answer to you. If I can just follow up one thing. A one-size-fits-all sometimes does not work here, and that's what I'm encouraging us to look at, mm -hmm. that something that works for us rather than follows every part of your standards. And if there is some deviation, is there consideration for that de deviation? And I know you can't answer that, but I would like you to look into that, how how we develop something that may be only applicable to a desert region that has no surface water and has minimal recharge and those issues. Sure. Yeah, okay. we understand that okay. every, every, every basin is a unique situation, and there's going to okay. be, you know, the <clears throat> these plans are all going to be unique. And... They are being held up to a specific standard, but we understand that there's going to have to be some, you know, uh, we're, we're going to have to look at them through different lenses uh, because of the, uh, the, the variety throughout the state. Thank you. Mr. Christensen. Is this on? Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Um, Brian, I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit, but since you're here, I'm going to <laughs> ask you. Um, you, you talked about Prop 1 funds, and uh, I know that a portion of the remaining funds are for disadvantaged communities. Is that like t 8 to 10 million or something? Some I don't know what the, the allocation is. Is that by county or is that by basin, or how, how, do, you, how do you measure that? Do you, do you know? The, the 8 to 10 million? Yeah, I mean, is that 
I know it's dedicated for disadvantaged communities. Had, because we have, I, I asked the question because the county is a disadvantaged county. That doesn't mean everywhere in the county is disadvantaged, but it has that designation. So, you know, it's good to know the answer. I had that information at one time. When, when Prop One first came out, I, was, I, I read up on it, and it, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have it today. I, and I can get back to you. That's fine. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, let me, let me look into that. I got a couple questions for you. First one is that 86 million follow up to what Mr. Christensen was saying. That 86 million dollars. I was told by Mr. Gutierrez that critically overdrafted basins can expect a focus of at least a minimum dollar, possibly more. Is that a true statement? Would you double check, Mr. Aster, Mr. Gutierrez? From I, I will. I will. I can't. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate. It. Second. Secondly, uh, the public is going to have questions about this presentation, best management practices, and I'd like to give them an opportunity to really sit down and chew on this. Sure. So is your presentation available, and how does the public gain it, get a hold of it? Yep. I have a PDF of it with me. I do have a PDF with me, but I realized this morning that I, that I forgot to include a slide on there, so um, I can make that correction. And what does a PDF mean? What does that mean? You have a PDF. Uh, I'm sorry. It, it's a. I, a I do have soft a copy, or is it hard to? You have it on paper or not? I do not have it as paper. Okay. I think what we. Well, how do we do that? Anybody smart enough to figure out how to do that, Mr. Christensen? Yeah. He, we. He can email it to us, and we can put it out on our website. Okay. For there, everyone to download. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank, Thank you. Very you. So let's move on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You'll be back next week, next uh, month. Uh. <laughs> Not yet. We can talk. Yeah, you'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, item five, consent agenda. Um, we have we have A through F approved meeting minutes of November seventeenth, two thousand sixteen. Retainer agreement with Lemieux and O'Neill. Retainer agreement with w James Worth. Retainer agreement with Office of County Council, Kern County. Appointment of Lauren Duffy as clerk of the board and approval of meeting minute, meeting calendar for 2017. Anybody of the public wishing to make comment on the consent agenda? Please come forward. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to ask for a clarification on the minutes. Uh, page, I don't see a page number. The uh, discussion under approval of recommendations from ad hoc committee on committee membership. Um, one, fifth item from the bottom, that's just one sentence, where it says, Mayor Breeden asked that a mutual water company be represented on the technical advisory committee. When I reviewed my notes from the meeting, I thought that the mayor was asking that one of the two reps for domestic well owners for the PAC be a representative for mutuals and cooperative well systems. Thank you. And your name is? Donna Thomas. I just, just for the record, thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Breeden? That was my intent. <laughs> uh, I thought that was more appropriate than to have two individual well owners who only represented themselves, and that's why I wanted a mutual. That and I named a number of them that had as many as eighty some odd connections. So that was what I was asking for. Okay, I would ask for a correction there on that item. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. We'll make that so. Thank you. Thank you. Who's action action under that? Mr. Christensen? Yeah, let me uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have some, some modifications to the uh, consent agenda. I'll uh, talk about one, and then I'll turn the time over to uh, Mr. Hall. Uh, the item um, C is, uh, there is no item C. Uh, we, we had set, uh, set a placeholder for that, but we do not have a retainer from the uh, water district. And uh, Phil can talk about uh, D. Um, on, on B and D, you have in front of you now a, a uh, retainer agreement from Keith's office and red line on page four, there is a change to the termination provision. That was requested by the water district. Um, me and Keith are both in agreement with the language and it would be added and changed in um, the retainer agreement with the county and the retainer agreement with Keith would reflect this language when executed. 
Okay, could you point me in the direction you're talking about? I don't know where we're talking about. Okay. It's in separate. Okay. It's in separate agreement that was handed out. Okay. It, it, oh. We received it from the water district after the agenda was done. So that's why we've, we've got it sort of separate here. All right. So say, say your piece again. Sure. Um, if you go to page four, yep. section nine is the yep. termination provision. Yep. It'll be section 10 in ours, um, our agreement because of another non-consequential section of our agreement. But this language will be added to the Kern County agreement for the termination provision and Keith's termination provision when executed. Okay. And, and the intent of the changes, I, as I understand, is to make give the uh, authority more flexibility when it comes to replacing or eliminating attorneys, which is fine. Yeah. It, it, brought, it brought up a sentence up higher in the, the clause, and then it also dealt with a little bit of what would be um, when the attorney is able to call a breach. But it's really non-substantive. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Any other public comment on the consent agenda? So I'm going to bring it back to the board. I'll close the hearing, bring it back to the board for approval of the consent agenda with the edits by Ms. Thomas and Mr. Hall. I, Ms. Wanted, Breeden. I wanted to um, pull item number 17, uh, number um, F, the meeting calendar. Uh, I had some concerns and some issues I'd like to address on that. May I do so yes, now? Sir. Okay. When, when in... Um, when we, our first meeting, and it was talked about meeting at 10 o'clock on this day, I asked us to let's con leave it as it is until December, and then after December, let's look at it and see how it worked for all of the people in this community. And last night at our meeting, and I've heard over and over again before that, but last night we had like an hour and a half of discussion on when we meet. And uh, it was a very long discussion. And, and, and I understand people saying 10 o'clock in the morning is not appropriate or, or easily accomplished by the public. And I don't disagree with that. I know many people, we see you all here, I don't know how many of you are working. And we, we use the criteria of how many people attended was it working okay for the public at 10 o'clock in the morning? It was clear last night that many of the public did not feel it was working well, and Keith and I had answered the public questions. One of the comments that was made, could we alternate? Could we at least then maybe look at opportunities to include more of the public if we have meetings at a different time at a, and not work? And I commented I knew the reasons we were doing it this way at 10 o'clock. Many of the staff come from far away. Many of the attendees come from far away. And we wanted to give them the opportunity because right after this meeting is another meeting at 2 o'clock. And those same people are coming. So if we meet at 7 o'clock, are we going to meet before or after? And there is, there is uh, issues. I understand it. I'd like to at least set up a time where if we have a meeting at a later point in time, those people who find it difficult to attend at ten, the board and staff could call in. Or could we set up a process wherein if it's going to be a very um, controversial decision that we have a meeting here at night. I understand that the people who are concerned about it feel like the decisions that are being made here are being made to affect them. And we are telling them, but this is when we're going to meet. And so I want to find a way to accommodate the needs of our public, our community, our electorate, and the people who are going to be affected by these decisions to be able to be there, not always at 10 o'clock in the morning, but at least be able to have the opportunity to meet at another time. If we want to adopt it this way, I understand. I want then to be the provision for other meetings, workshops, whatever, to be in the evening, however you want to do it, just so we can get our public involved and the people who are concerned that they may not have a voice. That's my reason. I think it's a great comment. Um, can I have some Brown Act counsel on uh, phone-ins? The ability of members to rather than drive to phone in, you have to have um, 
You have to properly notice the meeting, which means that you would tell the public where this phone-in session is going to occur at. The phone-in session has to be at a place that somebody could show up if they wanted to show up there also. Um, those are the two main issues. Um, yeah, the agenda has to be posted there. It's got to be a public area. Um, th that's really the, the big part of it, but then you also need to have a quorum of people actually here. But other than that, um, it, it, it can be done. I mean, we've done it for this hearing right now. We've got two remote locations in the two other counties that uh, are hearing this as we speak. Okay, I think um, that in the long run, as we move forward, having the public involved to the maximum extent possible is going to be a critical component of our success. If it doesn't happen, we're going to be a sale for all kinds of reasons that probably aren't true, but it's going to happen. In order to gain that trust, I think we have to go out of our way. I think uh, Collins, a great idea. So would it be okay if we adopt this this consent item today, uh, move out on that cons with that calendar, and then take uh, and be flexible enough so that we can change it come January and pro make different proposals to accommodate uh, to a greater level of public. Is would that be okay? I'm okay with that. Did someone else have a comment over there? I was just going to say, Chairman, we, we, this schedule can always be changed. Yeah. Um, it, it is sort okay. of a guidepost at this stage. If you told me something in February that you thought was controversial and you wanted to have the meeting at night, we just in January noticed the meeting at night. I just think um, that that's a really good point. I just think in the long run, uh, we're going to gain advantage of transparency by having the maximum amount of people available to come to these meetings. So we've got to go out of our way. That's our job. So let's do that. Was that okay with you? Yes, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Chair. I had a, a question regarding the minutes. The version of the minutes that was online for view as part of the packet is different from what I understand Ms. Duffy has as the final version. So I want to make sure I know which version we're, we're going to be adopting today. There were some changes that I had when she had sent out the draft for people to look at. I had some changes I had suggested back in, on November 21st to a couple sections, and she has those, but those didn't end up in the, um, the version that was posted as part of the agenda packet. I, I'd, I'd say we do not have those copies either. So uh, given that Don, uh, uh, Donna Thomas had some changes, why don't we bring back the minutes for the at the next meeting? Yeah, prefer to do that. Okay. It, given the changes, let's let's do that. That's so fine. we're we're removing A. Yes. And we're we're going to have consent agenda from B through F, and uh, we're going to bring back A C's later. C's out. A and C C's are out. Look, what what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> A and C are being removed from the okay. consent agenda and Thank won't you. be uh, heard today. Thank you. A and C is removed. So I'm asking for a if, barring any future comment, any other comments. A motion to approve the agenda, assent, consent calendar minus A and C. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion. Do we approve the consent calendar minus A and C? I will second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Moves on to public hearing item number six. A public hearing to consider election of the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority of Groundwater Sustainability Agency, GSA, for the entirety of the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Basin, and approval of the resolution for IWVGA to act as the GSA, and make finding the project is exempt from further CEQA review per sections 15061 Bravo and 3 and 15378 Bravo 5 of the state CEQA guidelines. Okay. So this is uh, the time and place for a duly noticed public hearing regarding the proposed formation of a groundwater sustainability agency for the Indian Wells Groundwater Basin in accordance with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. I declare this public hearing open and would ask a staff to report on this proposed action. Turn the time over to Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker. Good morning, members of the board, and good, morn good morning, uh, Ridgecrest community. Well, it's uh, taken a, long, uh, a bit of a time to get us there, but we're ahead of uh, many basins, and uh, it's my pleasure to review um, some of the... Uh, let, me, let me go to the next slide. This is my presentation. We're going to review some of the summary and background on Sigma, 
our favorite acronym these days, how it's implement, going to be implemented in the Indian Wells Valley, and then a, a, a brief next steps. Now, I just want to ask a question. I don't need to ask the board this, but I want to ask the community. How, how, how well uh, do you think you all know Sigma at this point? Do you feel like you've had quite a bit of information and, and uh, you're uh, somewhat familiar with it and what we need to do in this basin at this point? If you could raise your hands if you, if you feel that, yes. And, and so I get a feel for, uh, for how, the, uh, how the community that's sitting here, as I go through my presentation, how much detail to provide. Okay, so we got a few of them out there that, that still need this, so this is good. Okay, so the, the SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, was signed by the governor September 16, 2014, after a year of very uh, hurried and uh, focused discussions, uh, beginning in the Capitol actually in February. Uh, it took effect January 1, 2015, and it recognizes preference for management by local agencies. It provides additional authorities to these local management agencies to conduct studies, register and monitor wells, set well spacing requirements, require extraction reporting. I'll get more into the details on that. Regulate extractions, implement capital projects and assess fees to cover costs. And it provides the state as a backstop to regulate unmanaged or poorly managed areas. And uh, just uh, here's a little diagram of the state. On the left, it shows one of the first things that the state had to do was prioritize all 515 groundwater basins in the state uh, in terms of how they would be, whether or not they would fall under sigma. And the high and medium priority basins, those are the yellow and kind of orange ones, fall under sigma. Then the rest of them, the, the green and light green, uh, are low and very low, and they do not fall under the requirements of Sigma. Then the other step was uh, critically overdrafted basins, and I'll explain what that means in uh, upcoming slides, but uh, the state also identified 21 critically overdrafted basins, and Indian Wells Valley is one of those critically overdrafted basins. So these are a couple of slides from uh, DWR. Uh, Tim Ross gave this uh, with Department of Water Resources gave this presentation uh, slides. And so he reviewed um, a number of reports and found that groundwater level hydrographs, more than 30 of them, and this is basically a diagram of groundwater levels plotted over time, uh, it, uh, are in uh, chronic decline. And they're going down about one to two feet a year, depending on where you are. And so he reviewed over 20 uh, technical reports, and uh, that's part of the determination uh, that he came to in terms of uh, the state uh, considering the groundwater basin critically overdrafted, and also that there's some water, apparent water quality degradation, and, and that's basically that some areas have a, a little bit of uh, increase in uh, TDS, total dissolved solids, which is basically uh, increasing minerals in your water, making it harder, and you can taste it. Uh, here's one of the hydrographs. So on the left is the um, depth to water, and then uh, going across is the uh, time. And so this shows from 1960 to 2016 for one well, over 56 years, a 42-foot decline. So back to Sigma. So it's really a three-step process. I'm oversimplifying it, but these are the three main things you have to do. Step one is you have to form a groundwater sustainability agency in these high and medium priority basins, covering the entire high and medium priority basins by June 30th, 2017. Step two is developing a groundwater sustainability plan by January 31st, 2020. And step three is you're supposed to be sustainable, and that's uh, an interesting term. It's in the eye of the beholders, and we'll, we'll be learning about that over, more over the next few years, I would say, as we talk about sustainability. You have to do that uh, within 20 years of adoption of the plan. DWR may grant up to two extensions, five years each, if you're showing progress. Basically, if we're showing progress, uh, we should be okay. So we have, you can say that we have 20 to 30 years. 
Um, so what is a groundwater sustainability agency? What does it say in the law? It's a local agency or combination of local agency and local agency is any public agency that has responsibilities for any of the following within a basin. Water supply, water management, or land use. And, and, and the law allows uh, one or multiple GSAs in a basin. Uh, and then, so, uh, the, the domestic well owners are treated a little differently in the law. Uh, it, they're referred to as de minimis users, and they use less, uh, two acre feet or less, for domestic purposes. Uh, de minimis users are generally excluded from reporting how much they pump, but they may s be subject to pumping uh, reporting if state intervention occurs. And like all wells, domestic wells can also be regulated by non-segment entities uh, like the state or counties. Uh, what are the sigma public participation requirements for GSA formation? And we're following these, by the way. Inform interested parties about the act and GSA formation. Post a public notice and have a public hearing, and that's where we're at. And an explanation of how the interests of uh, all beneficial uses and users of groundwater will be considered under the development and operation of a GSA. And then for the groundwater sustainability plan development, there's also a public notice and a public hearing. And, and it says in the law, shall encourage the active involvement of diverse social, cultural, and economic elephants. Elements, not elephants. <laughs> well, at least I got to laugh somewhere. I know this is dry stuff, so I'm trying to... Okay, yeah. And, and this, this is basically just a list of the beneficial uses and users of groundwater that are in the law. So I'll just give you a second to look at that. And this is all, if you go to the Department of Water Resources website, I think we've posted these in various presentations, you can find all the information you want on Sigma and all the different things going on. Now, it, what if you don't do any of those three things I just pointed out? Well, there's a backstop in the law, which is called state board intervention. So after June 30th, the state can come in and, uh, and begin considering whether or not to declare the, the basin a probationary basin. And uh, after June 31st, 2020, um, in critically overdrafted basins, if you don't have your plan developed the, the, or the plan's inadequate, the state can step in. And uh, if by uh, January 31st for 2022, uh, if you're not a critically overdrafted basin, then the state can step in. And that's actually one thing I want to just step back and say. So the difference really in the law between a critically overdrafted basin and a non-critically overdrafted basin is that you have two years less. They want you to work harder and get it done quicker. On the funding side, what we're hearing, and uh, Supervisor Gleason alluded, alluded to it earlier, that the state is considering, uh, you know, helping those critically overdrafted basins a little bit more, um, whether it's technical assistance, funding, or whatnot. That's what we've heard, and we're looking forward to seeing where that ends up. I see Brian smiling, but you know, I'm, you know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see on that. So. Uh, now, we, you've heard about this Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority. It was formed under a joint powers authority. That's one of the things, one of the contracts or, or uh, yeah, it's a legal contract that you can use to form these groundwater sustainability agencies. This lists the uh, members of that agency. There's two types of members, general members, which are voting members, and then you have non-voting um, Associate members, that's what it's called. And so you can see it's the city of Ridgecrest, the Indian Wells Valley Water District, Inyo County, Kern County, San Bernardino County are the voting members. And then U.S. Bureau of Land Management and Naval Air Weapons Stations, the U.S. Navy, are the non-voting members, and they're all sitting up here. Now, there were some that opted out of the, uh, of the process and... Uh, the two uh, within the basin, Inyo Current Community Services Districts and Kern County Water Agency, opted out of a, out of it. Um, 
And then there are three that that just kind of overlap into the basin a little bit. They're, they're, they're just a small piece of them that overlap into the basin. That's Indian, I mean, Antelope Valley, East Kern Water Agency, Mojave Water Agency, and Rand Community Water District all opted out. They, they said, you know, just keep us informed. We don't, uh, we don't want to be a uh, part of that. We've got our own challenges to deal with in our own basins. So we adopted, one of the things that the board did was adopted principles for developing GSA governance options. And so that's building on the existing cooperation and successful management efforts in the Indian Wells Valley, the Cooperative Groundwater Group, and the Technical Advisory Committee that's been ongoing since 1995, and reinforce the Local Management Act principles in Sigma, shared resources, and identify a cohesive approach that costs should be equitably shared, represent community stakeholders through advisory committee, and com conduct robust and transparency. So the proposed GSA board, uh, GSA uh, determined by the state, the eligibility is determined by the state, as was listed in Sigma, and the GSA board for the new GSA would be the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority Board. And representation, this is the same as what's in the uh, Joint Powers Agreement. Elected officials serve as voting general members from Kern County, and then non-electeds may serve as general members from Inyo and San Bernardino County, alternate general members, and then associate members. Voting, one, one vote per GSA general member. The affirmative vote of a majority of the board shall be required for the approval of any board action. And no action may be approved by the board unless it receives the affirmative vote from no less than two of the then voting directors representing the County of Kern, the City of Ridgecrest, and the Indian Wells Valley Water District, at, which is the same as what's in the JPA, the Joint Powers Agreement. So the framework uh, is to have a strong advisory body um, for this public advice, the policy advisory body. It's really made up of public members and the GSA, and you'll see that. So strong advisory body, appointments, formal application process. The board will be discussing that a little bit later in the uh, board meeting. Uh, representation pack open to community members and uh, the GSA staff and transparency. Open and public meetings pursuant to the Brown Act. And then the decision making will be in a charter and protocols and will also be, I think, uh, include some of that will be included in the bylaws. So the role of these uh, of this policy advisory committee that we've been talking about for several months, advise and make recommendations to the GSA board on development and implementation of the groundwater sustainability plan and any other matter directed to the PAC's attention by the board, and it's advisory only. And all final decisions will, made by, will be made by the GSA board. So it's, it's really, you know, I, I want to just reword that a little bit. The PAC takes direction from the board on what they're doing, and then they provide their advice. And, and that's really it in a nutshell. I think, uh, I hope everybody agrees with that. <laughs> Uh, membership. So we've we've discussed the uh, membership uh, uh, a bit now. So we've uh, I've listed the uh, the five uh, voting G general members, the two associate members. We're, we're talking about two from agriculture, and those are listed up there. We've talked about this small agriculture. I know we talked about having a size, etc. But uh, I think that uh, it'll just be decided by the board. Uh, and then two business interests, two domestic well owners, and one planning um, representative, and one environmental, and, and, and those two are listed as well, the uh, planning and environmental. And then one industrial, and that's a listed one. And you can see those all listed up there. So we're talking about a, a policy advisory committee of 17, which is uh, not a small number. Um, but anyway, so that's, uh, that's what has already been approved in terms of membership. And what we haven't approved yet is the application and process. And that's what the board will take up today is how to, how to fill that membership. So next steps and timeline. So under the law, once you hold the public hearing and decide and a, and a board decides to move forward with the GSA, 
you notify the Department of Water Resources within 30 days of your public hearing. And uh, what you uh, include, um, specifically for Indian Wells Valley, what they're, what they're going to include as required is a map of the GSA service area and boundary, a copy of the Joint Powers Agreement forming the authority, a copy of the resolution forming the new GSA, a list of interested parties, and how their interests will be considered in GSA operation and GSP development and implementation. And then uh, DWR will post all complete notices, actually I should say, DWR will review the notice, the whole package, see if it's complete, and then we'll post it on their website if it's complete within 15 days of the receipt. And then the decision to become a GSA takes effect 90 days after DWR posts the notice. That is unless other GSA eligible agency files for the same area and overlap the area that was filed for. And um, I think that's it. So with that. Thank you, sir. I would ask uh, county staff how this hearing has been noticed. Mr. Chair, Alan Christensen, uh, st uh, staff. Um, Notice of the public hearing was published in the Bakersfield, California, in the annual register and the daily press in accordance with Water Code Section 10723B, or Bravo, and Government Code Section 6066. In addition, occurred, uh, pardon me, uh, the publications noticed in this location and our two remote meeting locations, which were established so this meeting could take place simultane simultaneously in the three counties that make up the basin. If any written comments to the proposal have been received, I would ask they be placed in the record and copies be provided, be provided to the board. We have no written. Thanks, sir. Thank you. At this time, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this matter? If so, please come forward to the podium, state your name and address for the, an address for the record, and present your comments. If you could all please, how, can I raise, how many people would like to speak? Okay. Which one over? Most of my comments uh, have please, to do with your map. Please uh, state your name. My name is James uh, Heiser. I live at 1768 West Bowman. Uh, your map is what we call very non-functional. Typically, when you do water district maps, you go from mountain peak to mountain peak. And if you look at, like, the IWV Canyon, you're only going up to 4,000 feet. Owens Peak is at 8,000 feet and would give you a larger area. So your map is, as we said, uh, Mike Stoned. Uh, Mike Stone came up with it. He had a set of requirements. Uh, he was asked to try to come up with where the water was really functionally working. Uh, we've since done more work, and, yeah, we do get all the water from Owens Peak. Uh, the snow we got two weeks ago, we got all that water. All that water technically fell out of your district. It was all above 5,000 feet, covering the mountains, and that is area that you do not have shaded. So your, your map is politically not correct, or as we tend to say, we're going to claim more area than that map has. We're going to claim to the peak of Owens, and we're going to claim to the peaks, and and we're going to do a standard water thing of you go from highest point to highest point, and not halfway up the mountain and stopping. That is kind of what we've done. James, could you, for the record, could you state your last name? I didn't get that. Jim Heaser, H E A S E R. Thank you, sir. Mr. Parker. Yes. Uh, uh, May I call you Jim? Sure, feel free. Okay, Jim. So what you're what you're discussing is the watershed, I believe. Yes. And and while we appreciate uh, and and would prefer to have the watershed, the law only allows the Bolton 118 basin, and that's what's actually on the map, and that's what applies under Sigma. This dialogue, by the way, is happening in many other areas where they've got they're concerned about the upper watershed being the source for groundwater recharge in part. So. Anyway, uh, just to clarify, the map is correct. It's a Bolton 118 basin boundary for Indian Wells Valley determined by DWR, and that's what we follow under the law. 
that Thanks, we're going sir. to have to remove the snow and the other issues that are feeding into the basin. I'm pretty sure if you watch the mountains uh, as per the newspaper, you saw the water slowly go away and come into the basin. So you're saying we don't have that. We, no, thank you, sir. No, I, we, this isn't time for comments. Okay. We can have this later, but okay. appreciate your comments, and they will be answered. Thank you, sir. This is a big deal, folks. Now's your time. Come on up. I uh, support this uh, formation of the Indian Wells Valley uh, Groundwater Authority. R Renee Westa uh, Lusk. Uh, it's very important we move on ahead. This is a very critical issue for our, the survival of our valley. I, I want a complete support of this GSA formation. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Okay, seeing no other takers, I'm going to uh, close the Ridgecrest public hearing and ask staff or ask if there are possible speakers in our remote locations in Yo and San Bernardino County. There All is no speakers. one in San Bernardino County. Thank you. Could you say your name again, please? My name is Lori Marsden for First District Supervisor Robert Lovingood's office. There is no one in San Bernardino County for public comment. Thank you, Lori. How about in Yo? Well, my name is April Zarelic, and I'm the only one in attendance here, and I have no comment. Thank you, April. Thank you, April. Seeing no further speakers, I declare the public hearing closed. At this time, we are ready to approve the following resolution. And let me read it and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Christensen. Resolution of the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority electing to become the Groundwater Sustainability Agency for the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Basin and make a finding that the formation of the Groundwater Sustainability Agency is exempt from further CEQA review pursuant to CEQA guidelines sections 15061 Bravo 3 and 15378 Bravo 5. Any other thoughts, comments from the board before we make the vote? Mr. Chairman, uh, Alan Christensen, um, you, that, was, that was correct as you read. We have uh, a couple of changes to the resolution. You should have that in front of you. They are, they are minor, but I will note them. On page two, uh, the, from the packet that was distributed to the public, it, uh, at the bottom in section two it says it is resolved by the Board of Supervisors. We, we changed that to uh, the Board of the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority. And then on page three, uh, number four, this board hereby elects to form a GSA for the entirety of the basin, period. And there is no attachment uh, or a, a p attachment A or appendix A. Um, that was an error. So we've corrected that in the form that you have in front of you. Uh, that's all. Just wanted to note that for the record. Thanks, sir. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. In the staff report? Correct. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, um, in terms of making sure the public um, knows how important that we believe this whole process is, there was one item that's not included in the resolution, but it is in our agreement that I think is important that the public understand that, that we understand about the importance of this, which is in the recitals for our um, joint powers agreement, the members stated that whereas the general and associate members individually and collectively have the goal of cost-effective, sustainable groundwater management that considers the interests and concerns of all the communities and parties that rely upon the basin for their water supply. Um, I think that's something that when we started this process, we all agreed to, and I think it's important that you all in the audience know that that's important to us. Uh, and the second thing that I wanted to just point out that's in the agreement that um, there was a, a mention in the presentation about the voting um, structure and, and the requirements for voting, and, and the one little piece that's, that's um, different from, from that standard process is that 
when the policy advisory committee gets to the point where they will present a recommended groundwater sustainability plan to this board or an amendment to it or any other update to it, um, we've included in the joint powers agreement that um, an approval of that recommendation takes a supermajority. It's not a simple majority. So if there's all five of us here, it will take four votes to approve a GSP or an amendment to it. If there's only four of us here, it will take three votes. If there's three of us here, it will take two votes. So I just want to make sure they're clear that that um, when we say that it's good, that's an advisory to this board, um, in order to, to make a decision on that, we've decided that that's so important that it needs a supermajority. Thank you, sir. I need a motion. Um, I move that we approve um, Resolution 16-1. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Done. Item number seven, approval of policy advisory committee application and process. <clears throat> Mr. Christensen. Mr. Chairman, uh, Alan Christensen, um, at the last meeting, uh, the board directed staff to uh, develop an application. I think that was at the uh, request of uh, Mr. Longbottom, and that was that was a, a welcome a request. Um, the PAC is the primary policy advisory uh, uh, committee to the uh, Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority. Uh, as uh, was mentioned in the presentation, the role of the PAC is very clear. It's to provide advice and ultimately, um, and recommendations, ultimately the board um, itself will um, make decisions regarding a GSP or and beyond that. <clears throat> Um, you had asked that we bring back an application. Uh, we have an application process or application form here. It's printed out, but we will have it in electronic form so that folks wishing to apply can do that electronically. They can just enter their name and fill it out. If they'd like a hard copy, we can provide that as well, assuming that your board uh, approves this today. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's primarily for the positions of agriculture, uh, one, one slot for agriculture small, two biz business interests and two domestic well owners. Um, as far as process goes, applications will be compiled by the uh, Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority Clerk of the Board and screened for completeness. All complete applications will be reviewed by the board and appointments for those positions will be selected on a basis of the information submitted in the applications. And uh, we believe that will and that uh, decision we make made at a public meeting of the board um, when that time comes. So it's our recommendation to approve the PAC application and uh, uh, the, the, the process we've outlined here. I'm sure that others, uh, this, this uh, effort is done with a number of individuals. I'm sure uh, others can uh, add, if they'd like, of the staff, if they'd like to add to uh, anything I might have missed. So that's our recommendation. We, we ask that the board approve this application and process. Thank you very much. Did you have something to say, Ms. Baca? Okay, let's open the public hearing and let's hear what you have to say. Anyone in the public wishing to comment on item number seven, the approval of a policy advisory committee application and the process? Are the people in Inyo and San Bernardino still on? I think so. I, I believe so. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Del Haletic. Or is it afternoon? Anyway, um, I do have a question on this application, um, not per se, but I would like to know what the criteria is. If we fill all this out and turn it in, uh, according to the application, there's some um, different sections for you to evaluate. What is the criteria, whether we pass or not is how are you going to judge whether we're worthy of being on the pack through this application? Thank you very much. We'll get an answer to you. How do you do that? Okay. Got it. Donna Thomas, um, Mr. Chair, I just had a question. Are there going to be any hard and fast? Deadlines about um, the agencies nominating their proposed uh, representative for their organization. 
One more time, Ms. Thomas. For instance, Eastern Current RCD, where, where I think this package says we need to nominate someone in January to represent us on the PAC. If our full board is not appointed by that time, do we have a longer time period? Is there a hard and fast uh, deadline? Thank you, Ms. Thomas. I'll get that answer to you. Good question. Okay. I've got two questions in the public's still open, maybe three. Judy Decker. Uh, I believe the Sigma law states that uh, members of the advisory PAC committee cannot be currently serving on another board. And I'd like to know if that applies here, if this is if you're going to follow this. Because your, your application says nothing about it. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have anybody on from San Bernardino? Or Inyo? In that case, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. We have three questions to address primarily from, from the public, and uh, then I'd like to also hear your, your comments. Ms. Pindon. I have one. Is there priorities given? Uh, is one area of experience or one area of the answers any greater, more value than any others? Is it just an overall, or are we looking for something specific? Thank you. So, so we got three questions. Let's talk about this one because I think yours, Ms. Breeden, folds in very nicely with the first question, which was the subjective qualifications for the application. How do we make determinations? Who, you know, do we want meat or do we want chicken? I mean, <laughs> what do we want? How do how we go about that with this, using this application? No Ms. pork. Christensen, go for it. Or okay. Pork or chicken. No. Um, this is Alan Christensen. Um, I'll do my best. Um, we. Have to, we, we've had this discussion about how detailed we should get with, you know, how much, how much, how, um, uh, you know, how bureaucratic. I don't want to use that in a in a bad way, but how much detail is required and and should to guide our process. I can tell you that I I think the the belief, and I don't represent all, but I think the belief is that uh, of the staff was that this would be very much like. Um, when your agencies appoint a planning commissioner or a, a, any kind of committee member, uh, ultimately um, you have discretion. And um, the application material is only to help you. Um, we would, we would add, uh, my, my approach is a customer service approach. If somebody didn't fill it out completely or we wanted more information, we'd go ask for it. We'd say, well, do you mind putting something in here? Before we brought it back to you, uh, but ultimately you you would have the um, discretion to to appoint whoever you wanted to, and that's sort of what it comes down to, I believe, uh, with with these kinds of appointments. Um, again, you may, as individual members or as a group, you may feel that that experience in water is good, or or ex not experience in water, it would be helpful to or, or a public. Uh, Oh, sorry. That's good. Even the staff gets zinged. Um, so, so uh, we have not got that far. We, we, we. This this application is before you because we thought it was general enough, but had some details so that we can so we can know something about the person. Um, but if you would like us to to add more, we can surely do that. I'm, Mr. Brown. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Peggy, uh, I was thinking um, that we were going to look at an aggregate of a person. There wasn't any one attribute that uh, we're looking for. I, I think uh, the whole point of this this uh, pack was to have a a, 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 a good cross section of our community, and so I like the general application. I, it just gives you a feel for who um, who the, who these people can be. And um, I think you just get a feel for it, I, and, and I, I like it this way. I, 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 I see it being just as you get a feel for how, and then you also have to say, well, how are these people going to work with others? You know, if a guy says he lives in a log cabin out in the middle of nowhere and doesn't want to talk to you, of course, he probably wouldn't fill that out, but it wouldn't. 
it wouldn't I it wouldn't really be that great of a of a addition. So I think that I think that this is perfectly fine, and I like general, easy, breezy stuff. Thank you, Mr. Brown. My, my question is: the, the Joe Schmo is going to fill out the application. Mary Jane is going to fill out the application. Two applicants are going to come in and come before the board, and the board is going to do this in public, have a review of the applicants, and make have a conversation and publicly make a decision by majority by majority vote. Correct. Yeah. Chairman, if that's what you would like, that's what will happen. That's what I'm thinking. Well, that's not what I would like, it's what this board would like. Yeah. But I think uh, we'll get there to that point, and I think that's probably going to be the, the best interest of transparency. I also agree, Ms. Brown, with what you said. Uh, there's no one criteria that anyone is going to have that's going to cause me to say you're the person other than those that are explicitly detailed in the membership requirements. I'm going to look at the totality of a person. I'm going to look at the contribution. I'm going to look at the balance that we can achieve by having that person uh, contribute uh, to, in my estimation, my vote will go towards uh, is, is that person contributing to a, to, to, will that person contribute to a quality decision? Whether I agree with it or not, it's going to be, does that fit in with our community? And that's going to be how I'm going to make that dis decision. And I think that's, I believe that kind of too. Saying. Yes. As far as Ms. Thomas, where'd you go? Ms. Thomas, uh, that's my fault. Well, not my fault. But the, but the issue is, the reason she brought that up is we have applications turnover in the RCD and we have two nominations that are up. I have interviewed one, I'm scheduling an interview with the second one. I expect those nominations to be made fairly quickly and uh, we'll have those names to you in a satisfactory time. But we will provide you the flexibility to provide uh, the, the perfect person to represent uh, the RCD on the board. The other one I can't speak to, and that is uh, conflicts with the PAC and other um, issues, other boards. I'm not exactly sure what uh, the reference chairman is to Sigma and conflicts with other boards. Um, not aware of any provision in Sigma that says you can't be on multiple boards. There are some general conflict of interest laws that could come into play, but um, we, of course, will deal with those and, and abide by them as they come up. But right off the top of my head, I don't believe it would be an incompatible office, so that one is out. And then um, whether or not there are other financial conflicts, that will have to be addressed. And, and members of the PAC will be filing Form 700s. So um, conflict of interest law will be dealt with and addressed by the PAC. Well, I know I'm on about 15 boards. so. Okay. Uh, did I close the public hearing, or is it wide open? Yes, sir. Um, I, just, I wanted to get some clarification from either staff with an ad hoc committee uh, on a, a point. At the the last meeting, uh, the ad hoc committee provided a draft document called a charter, which included a couple statements about um, the roles and responsibilities of the members of the PAC, and indicated in that document that um, someone who was on the PAC would present their constituent members' views on issues being discussed. And another point was that they would keep their constituencies informed about the deliberations and actively seek their constituents' input, um, which when I read that a month ago, I was thinking that um, for the seats on the PAC that aren't named to a specific entity, that perhaps this, this body would be encouraging an organization or a, a representative group out there um, realtors group or, or something to nominate something rather than just doing an open call or maybe a combination of those things. So I don't know whether that's still going to be part of the application process is to seek input from a domestic well owners group as to terms of who they would like to see represent them. But that was a, a clarification I was seeking because of the way the staff report for this was written, it simply mentions that this would be the application process for those seats for agriculture, small business interests and domestic well owners. But I was anticipating we'd be doing some sort of encouragement of a nomination process from representative groups. Can, can I comment on that? Yes, sir. Uh, that charter is still, we have an ad hoc committee to, to refine it, and I think some of those details about what it exactly says in the charter, I, there are some things in there uh, that um, seem to be inconsistent with the Brown Act, for example, and there are other issues that we've Identified, so that's something we're going to hash through. So I wouldn't get too wedded to the specific language in the charter right now. Uh, there's going to be a discussion on it. Does that answer the mail? 
It, it answers the question but regarding staff, but as in terms of the ad hoc committee, um, would it your anticipation that we would encourage um, a business organization to nominate somebody? That, that's another point I would want to get to. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, can I say that first before I talk? Sorry, I got to get used to that. And these microphones need to be much longer. Anyways, um, um, the, the 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 intention was, uh, like for business, I thought like the Chamber of Commerce would have been an excellent organization to um, to uh, choose a representative. And for business, um, I, that one was kind of tough. Uh, I was thinking maybe the Board of Realtors or something like that. Um, but that was the intent. Um, I, I think we'll develop that. Um, it was, it was, it's difficult when you're trying to figure out how to represent the, the entire community. But those two organizations, I think, uh, business-wise, for sure the, the uh, Board of Realtors, I think, represents all the realtors. Or maybe I'll, I'm wrong, but in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, most of the businesses in town belong to that. And if not, they could join and, and be a part of that. So that was the intent. That was my understanding. Okay, I see no other comments. I'm looking for a vote. A motion. I make the motion that we approve um, um, the advisory committee application and process as it's in our board packet. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Move this to item number eight adoption of 2017 annual budget and future funding and finance options. Ms. Christensen. Um, actually, we're going to have uh, Tim Parker uh, give this presentation. Mr. Chair and uh, board members, so this is on page 47 of the PDF of your package. And so um, if you flip a couple pages, additionally, there's a table there, and I'll start with that. So the, uh, so the proposed 2017 budget's uh, broken up into income and expenses. And the proposed income is, uh, you can see it's listed there, carryover from contributions of 75000 and a, a DWR grant, which is 250000 and uh, in-kind city meeting space, which is a rough number on, on what the city's been providing. And so it amounts to $326,500. And uh, then uh, the expenses are listed, uh, GSA administration, and then the... Uh, you, uh, a total of 121.5, uh, and then USGS study of 90,000, property assessment rate study, which we've talked about before, was getting started on having some sort of a cost of services or rate study consultant be, get working on that, and then uh, starting the GSP development, which includes getting the, the PAC organized and starting to meet and starting to uh, put together the GSP. So that's the total expenses. And um, that's what's proposed for the 2017 budget. And it's in the narrative on page one of the staff report. Uh, a couple of other things that come to mind as we're thinking about this moving forward. Number one, 2017, it's the first year of real operation. So we, this is a pretty big guess. And uh, we probably won't spend all the grant in one year, but uh, it's at least uh, something that we can work with to start with. And so we'll be learning as we go. We'll be, uh, we'll be, revi we'll be uh, reviewing the budget as we go, and that's, that's what's intended with that. Then uh, future funding and finance options is the other part of this report. We need to be thinking about that. Um, you know, the $75,000 contribution isn't going to go very far. And that's why there is this proposed cost of service or rate study. That that's going to take some time. Uh, I know uh, uh, legal has been uh, legal has been uh, advising us on on the timing for that. And uh, I don't know. You may have questions for them on that item, but uh, that's one of the things. The additional Prop One Sigma grant that we talked about. It's it could be five hundred to a hundred thousand dollar. I mean five hundred to a million dollars. Uh, that's item one under future funding and finance options. There could be, uh, you can also consider loans uh, from uh, the state and or general member agencies under the grant loan program. And then the fees, the property assessment or pump tax or, or whatever, you know. We know this is going to take uh, money to, to pay for this in the future. 
and then uh, additional member contributions. And these, this is just a running list of options. It's not any priority list except for the Prop 1 grant. And so, and the likelihood of uh, receiving that grant, we think, is very high. Um, the, the department wants to give money to these organizations to be successful. Everybody wants this, this, uh, these uh, organizations to be successful. So that's uh, one point. Um, and, and we should be uh, looking at uh, additional options for funding. Besides uh, the Prop 1 Sigma grants, there's other uh, grant opportunities out there. And so we may want to consider how we're going to do that, whether that's uh, looking at some kind of a funding or finance committee moving forward or an ad hoc group, really to start thinking on how we're going to fund this thing moving forward. Some people are calling this a stopgap time. So it's the time between when you start the agency to when you have some sort of a sustainable funding stream, which would be your fees. So that's what we have to look forward to. And that could be a couple of years. We know the Prop 1 grant for the GSP, they're talking, uh, DWR is uh, in, in their literature that's posted, talking about the proposal solicitation package. You know, they love acronyms over there. We all do. PSP will be available in the springtime, the draft, and then it'll be finalized in the summer. Uh, applications will go in uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but the money, the uh, actual awards won't occur until near the end of the year. Uh, or actually, I'd take that back. They'll occur within a few months, but the money won't be available till the end of 2017 or into 2018. So that's just an uh, you know an overview of that. So uh, that's that's kind of my summary. And so back to the 2017 budget. That's what we've got for you. Before we go to the public, let me ask a quick question. On the last page where the table is, what's ten thousand dollars for special services? Alan, maybe you can answer that. There is no, uh, Alan Christensen, through the chair, um, there is no um, uh, specifics. This, th this is just indicative of much of the budget line items you see here, other than the, the USGS study and, and uh, some of the larger amounts uh, allocated for rate study and GSP development are just estimates. Uh, they're, they're things that could come up. Um, smaller things, we don't know. Okay. It's just it's just a number at this Fair point. Enough. It's like the seven thousand for insurance. We're not spending that seven thousand. We've just created a line item and we yeah. put a number. In it's it. an estimate. It's a point yeah. for these dollars, We're not spending it. Okay, let's open the public hearing and listen to what you have to say about this item number eight. Yes, ma'am. Becker, I don't have anything on this, but I offer you something that you haven't mentioned. Now that you're an official GSA board, I presume that you are going to form committees similar to what the Water District in the city has so that less than a majority can meet and discuss items that will be on the, the next agenda in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for comment, consideration, and a motion. I have a question. Yes, Through the chair, I'm asking about the grants that are available from uh, the State Department of Water Resources and wherever. Is there only a one time grant? Do you have the ability to uh, amend, change? redo another one after the first? Should you be lucky enough and blessed enough to get it? How do you do? Are you then down at the bottom when other grants are made? Well, it depends on how they set up their criteria, but that's generally not true. No, I mean, and so there are different pots of money out there. In, in Prop 1 under the Integrated Regional Water Management Program. Under uh, groundwater sustainability, there's both groundwater quality, which is, I think, $800 million, uh, and then there is uh, $100 million for actual groundwater sustainability plan development and small projects. There's, there's other, uh, stormwater uh, is another one, recycled water, all under that $7.6 billion 
grant applicate uh, grant uh, or I'm sorry proposition. So, no, uh, that that that's not the case. Okay, let me then follow up, if I may. Do we have somebody doing that? Oh, looking at grants? Yes. Uh, currently, uh, no. I mean, I think the separate organizations look at their particular needs, but uh, but that uh, that was one of the things that I, I, I mentioned was the the board may want to consider forming a funding uh, uh, ad hoc group or a funding committee or a finance committee of some sort to to really uh, that could be one of the things they focus on, and along with especially in this first year tracking the budget because it's it, this is a new operation. Great, thank you. That's number nine. Yeah, I knew. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, here's go. Yes, sir. I just a couple things I wanted to try to get clarification on the budget on the the income side. Um, it indicates that the initial contributions from the member agencies is being carried over, so none of that's been spent to date. Okay, and. Given that it's still seventy-five thousand, then um, that's being held in a trust account that doesn't earn interest. I'd have to uh, through, through the chair, um, Alan Christensen. Uh, uh, I'd have to check with our staff at the county. Uh, I don't know if they allocate interest or not. Um, I, I, I know our investment rate is probably pretty low, so if we do get interest, it's very low. But I will I'll, I'll send an email back to you on that. Okay, thank you. And then on the, and I understand that these are, the are these are estimates at this point, but under expenses, I'm assuming that consulting services would be an engineering hydrologist potentially that we'd bring on to start working on on the GSP with the committee, and the thirty thousand for the rate study would be to most likely to hire an outside firm to help us with that, um, and I know it's more of this details included in the next item on the agenda. Um, but in looking at that next item, it appears that the potential timeline for bringing on these people is, is in the first part of the year. So, but it's your estimate that that's going to be enough for for those those consultant contracts to get us through the year. Through the chair, uh, uh, Alan Christensen, that um, that's what we're grappling with. Um, it, that is, you've you've hit on a uh, a sort of a a, a reality, which is. Uh, how do we pay for how do we pay for all this? So, on the next item, we'll we'll have some more discussion about that. Uh, again, they're all estimates at this point. Okay. And then the, at the meeting last month, um, there was a, a question regarding the timing for bringing on a general manager, executive director, whatever we end up calling that position. Um, and I don't see I don't appear to see a line item for that in the budget. Um, so that would be something else that would have to be addressed if the board decides it wants one sooner rather than later, correct? That's correct. Okay. And let's see. And then just in terms of that, what you said you're grappling with, um, Mr. Parker, as part of his presentation, indicated he thought it may be unlikely that, that we would spend the whole amount of the $250,000 grant that Kern County was uh, good enough to um, secure for this effort. Um, but there's also in the budget report and also last month some discussion about if there is a gap in funding, what our options are until we get a, reven a steady revenue source. Um, are we intending to have a discussion about that with this item, the next item, another meeting? The, uh, the, the next item, we'll, we'll introduce the idea and, uh, and you'll hear much, much more in January, probably a much more comprehensive um, report on uh, revenue measures or options. Okay. Thank you. Good questions, all. I was expecting for this meeting to be really uh, a long, wild, woolly affair with the hearing, public hearing for the GSA, so I light-loaded it with a focus on that, hoping that we can move these other topics down the road and achieve those in January. So that's why a lot of those questions remain unanswered, but will be soon. Thank you. Okay, uh, so any other questions? I need a motion. No, you get this one. <laughs> well, uh, as uh, as a member agency that doesn't have a big stake in this, but uh, is concerned about the budget, I'll uh, make a motion to approve the budget as uh, presented. I'll second. Thank you, Matt. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving to the right along item number nine: report on projects and objectives of the IWVGA. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, Alan Christensen, uh, you have a, a staff report before you. Uh, we're going to do this on a regular basis, sort of listing out our, our to-dos, uh, so to speak. A and uh, we're adding to these all the time. Uh, let me go through them. Um, these are mostly short-term items, but uh, we see this expanding uh, to um, so that you have a sense of where we're going. Uh, number one, um, file a GSA application with the approval, with your action today. We will we'll start that process um, this week, uh, tomorrow, and uh, it, it may not go, up, go to DWR until uh, Friday or Monday, but uh, we'll do it as soon as we can. Um, we've, we've done, at least the county has done uh, several of those filings, so we're familiar with them, so it, it could be done by Friday. Um, we've got some ad hoc committee work uh, that's going to be carried forward into January, both uh, the bylaws um, and, um, and, and so forth. Um, you'll approve the bylaws in, um, hopefully in January. Again, these, some of these dates can get pushed off. Uh, discussion of groundwater fees uh, and an ad hoc committee. I'll discuss that in a moment. Uh, ad hoc committee, uh, ad hoc or point pack committee members, you have an, uh, an application process now. Uh, we can uh, start uh, taking applications. We see that happening in January. Uh, contract for a uh, consultant hydrological uh, person for a GSP. Uh, it's likely that will go further. Uh, Further than January, but uh, um, we're trying to trying to uh, push ourselves a little here. TAC formation and structure again, January and February of next year. Special outside counsel for groundwater. I'll have the uh, uh, the, the council uh, talk about that in a moment, and then prepare a grant application to DWR. That's been talked about. Uh, that might be July. It might be a little later than that, but uh, hopefully summer we'll have some word about uh, what's available and what the timelines are for applications. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the item I wanted to discuss is number five, discussion of groundwater fees and, and an ad hoc finance committee. Um, as uh, as uh, Mr. Page had mentioned, uh, timing is critical. Um, depending on how quickly we move, um, need, the need for funds could be could happen very quickly, and uh, we could burn through uh, the grant funds quickly. Um, it, it just depends on on how we move. There are some some critical uh, timelines, um, not just the GSP, but earlier than that, uh, that we need to deal with, and so. Um, uh, possible hiring of consultants, studying revenue options, uh, required public meetings, public noticing, timeline for adoption, and perhaps county tax roll issues or deadlines are, are some of those concerns. Uh, given, the, given that reality, uh, we staff recommends that with regard to finance, particularly with revenue measures, that, we, that, uh, that you appoint an ad hoc finance committee. It doesn't have to be this, the same uh, at committee that's uh, ad hoc committee that exists now for the bylaws, but uh, we really think that would be helpful in uh, and and more speedy and efficient to get uh, an ad hoc involved in that. So we're asking that um, for you to consider that today. Um, uh, with regard to the special counsel item, we'll turn the time over to. Uh, I, I can answer any questions on that if you have any right now. Okay. Senior. Okay. We'll turn the time over to uh, Phil. I think it's some comments. Thank you. Um, Chair, really nothing new here. We've, As we've talked about, you know, long before we even had the JPA finally finalized, we were going to seek outside special counsel for groundwater, um, and we are in the process of doing that. We've reached out to a couple firms already, getting comments back. Um, We'll, we'll talk with Jim, see if Jim has any other ideas of who we should reach out to. But that's an ongoing process, and you should be hearing back in January. Hopefully in January, maybe February, we'll move over to also. Thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate staff report. Let's open the public hearing. Anyone thoughts on items number nine, Alpha and Bravo? Come on up. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board through the chair, Derek Hoffman of Gresham Savage, legal counsel for Meadowbrook. 
We recognize there's a lot of work to be done over the next several years and uh, in operating the GSA and uh, developing and implementing the Groundwater Sustainability Plan. And one of those tasks is going to be figuring out funding for those operations in that plan. And staff report indicates, and Mr. Christensen has indicated, that, um, that those funding options might include things like property taxes and assessments, pumping fees, uh, or some combination of those. And those funding questions are a matter of significant public interest and concern, as they could affect basically every property owner, person, or pumper in the basin. And so for that reason, uh, we would respectfully object to this concept of an ad hoc finance committee, which we understand would be um, meeting in private. Uh, although I haven't heard a lot of discussion on it today, I'm on here because this is the public comment opportunity. Um, and instead of having an ad hoc finance committee that meets in private, we would urge the board to keep with the letter and intent of the joint powers agreement and consistent with the comments of Mr. Chairman and, and Director Page today about the importance of public participation on issues important to the public. And um, instead of having uh, an ad hoc uh, finance committee that meets in private, keep with the joint powers agreement, which provides that committees of the board are to operate in public. Those meetings are to be publicly noticed and held uh, within the Brown Act. And so instead, the, the board already has and is establishing a policy advisory committee. And we would suggest that the board utilize that policy advisory committee to advise on these important policy questions about funding for the GSA and the GSP. Uh, as you know, that policy committee in includes representation from each member of the board as well as a number of other uh, interested parties in the basin, including uh, pumpers, businesses, and property owners. And so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for comment and consideration. Yes, sir. Um, Couple questions. Uh, when we started this, uh, I know that we all put it money in seventeen five or whatever it was for the first year. Is that two thousand sixteen? So do we get to do it again in two thousand seventeen? Um, the other thing is, and I haven't vetted this with my board, uh, and it's not. I'm not going to like surprise you or anything. <laughs> but we do have an account um, that we call it future source of supply, and I can go to my board and ask them if we can uh, use that as a lending account of some sort. Um, we've been putting money in there for quite some time for something like this. We, we want it to be, we really want it to be spent on facilities and things like that. However, it's sitting in an account. So um, I, I could certainly do that. And if you're looking for a stock gap, we could, uh, I, can't, I can't speak for my board, um, but I don't know why we wouldn't if, if it's a loan uh, to this agency or this, this committee. So um, that's a possibility. Um, and then the other, the other thing is, um, we, we created this buy-in, annual buy-in. It was pretty low. Um, we might want to revisit that. I don't know what other agencies. I know you guys have designated funds, and, and you have, like, a general account and stuff. We're water, so our stuff is kind of focused on water. It's a little easier for us to spend money. I know it's a lot harder for the cities and counties to do the same. Um, but we might want to, and I know that you guys are coming up with budgeting and stuff. Uh, everybody might want to look at their budget and see, well, can we all afford to put in a little bit more um, for the 2017 year? So those are just my suggestions. Thank you, sir. I'm uh, questioning why you would assume the committee meetings would be secret. I'm, I'm, um, I was just very surprised that you would think that would, especially finance. I'm... I can't even imagine why anybody would make the assumption that we're, we would even consider secret committee meetings. I, I, I don't know about secret, uh, Madam Mayor, but the I think what we're really talking about here is, is more of like a staff level because we've got the various agencies involved. We have to get our staffs together to come up with a proposal. I think that's more of what we're talking about here. There's, if we're going to ever adopt any of these fees, there's going to be a very significant public process okay. uh, it, and uh, there's going to be vetting on I imagine multiple meetings before that gets, uh, gets I was just adopted surprised by the secret comment because it just 
I can't I, even conceive of us approving it, of that. Well, if we're let me let me put it because we we've got an ad hoc uh, meeting on the bylaws, and that's uh, uh, Supervisor Gleason and um, Member Brown and a couple and the staff. And that's really just to kind of formulate the original version of the bylaws. But before you adopt the bylaws, we're going to obviously present it at a public meeting, and it's going to be fully vetted by the complete board and the public. So, okay. but sometimes we need to have these ad hoc meetings just to kind of start the process. So, what about that? Go ahead. Let me add, and it's a good point that uh, uh, Mr. Lemieux brings up. Um, because you meet monthly, starting the process is important because if we wait one month to, to start anything, well, we, we won't get anything done. It'll just be very, very, very slow. Um, some of, you know, we meet weekly with the Board of Supervisors so they can give direction and so, uh, so forth. But if we don't get started uh, with, you know, staff, staff and some direction, then it just it just slows it down. I, I think there is need to to move pretty quickly. Um, the, the, we've had this discussion internally as well, and I may as well share. Um, the county has uh, ha, we, I've talked with uh, members of the of the of the staff about the, the county's commitment currently that we cannot continue to to uh, to subsidize. Thank you. Good word. I heard that. Subsidize or pay for. Uh, some significant costs uh, of um, for consulting, and so not not that they're not worth it, but but we are when you say, when you have forty four million dollar deficit, um, you, you know we have to look at everything. So uh, I only mention that because and that that only further um, explains or clarifies how quickly we could burn through money if. If we, if, when you start adding, you know, staffing, consulting, and so forth, you, uh, revenue measure is very important. But anyway, my original point is if we don't get started, the suggestion of an ad hoc was exactly like Keith said, so that we could get going, um, and and then we're going to roll it out and have discussions on it for sure. But that's up to you. But um, just want to share that. I I guess I'm not. Um disagreeing with that because clearly there has to be a beginning and the beginning is what you're going to bring to the public and with comment I'm not I was concerned that somebody thought and forgive me if I'm interpreting what you said that all this is going to be done in secret and you're going to pop it up and say here it is it's done and I don't want that impression to be out there um. So I think there's I see there's two different issues here. One is um, ongoing member contributions, and that does seem like we should. I think we have some commitment to working, figuring out how that's going to be proportionally assigned. And so I hope that we can come up with uh, a plan for that because that that will be a funding source. But as far as the ongoing um, uh, financial situation. That's going to have to be will be a, will be a real public issue. I, I suggest if you do have, if you're going to set up an ad hoc committee to come up with uh, some ideas on that, come back then in a workshop form where we where the board gets to hear what all the issue what all the possibilities are and narrow that down and and do that in a, maybe that's an evening meeting so that you do get a lot of public input on it and and exposure on it and then. Get, give the board time to work through what those, you know, what the what the plan will be for ongoing ongoing expenses of the GSA are going to be a, a really important issue that we have to have some time to work through. I I believe, but the the member contributions that does seem like that's something that we need to, uh, as a board or as staff, come up with a proposal for, um, and that that doesn't seem like that's going to be quite as a public process or need to have as big a public process as the, on, the ongoing financing of the, of the GSA. Thank you, Chair. I just I wanted to clarify one thing. Um, you know, member Brown, in, in his comments about the member contribution, 
I don't know if I understood you correctly to be uh, interpreting the agreement to be that we had to have annual contributions, but there's no requirement in the JPA agreement for annual contributions. There's a requirement for initial contribution, and the um, possibility that there will be future contributions that will have to be equitably shared, but there's no requirement for it. So I, I, I agree with, with, with Member Kingsley that this will be a discussion of the board in terms of whether that's the approach we take and, and, and what that amount should be. Um, the other thing that I, I on the special counsel for groundwater um, portion of this item, the um, this board has not yet adopted bylaws which are still being developed, so we don't have procurement policies. So I'm just kind of curious. I'm assuming that what's been done in terms of reaching out is, has been to follow what Kern County will do when they're hiring special counsel. But I just wanted to get some clarification of the procurement process that's being used for special counsel. We have a proposed language in the bylaws for that. So that will be something I guess the ad hoc committee will be talking about this month. Thank you. Commander. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple questions about the, um, I guess, the the schedule moving forward, but they're not budget related. So I don't want to derail if there's further conversation on the budget. But before we move off this topic, I do have a couple. Okay. So let's keep, let's hold that in advance. Let's finish follow through on this one because I think it's important. Any other thoughts about budget? What I thought was interesting about Mr. Hoffman's comments was that I don't see how you can establish policy without understanding cost. Eventually, you can't, you can't say, I'm going to go this way if it's going to cost a billion dollars because you can't do it. So this cost is a very much of a variable in consideration for the PAC when they uh, finally come to a point with, when they develop policy. So I think we got we got to go. I understand the urgency of, uh, of the requirement to move quickly to develop some genesis for for having ideas and throwing ideas around publicly to get us moving for the first year to get that going but then i i also think that budgetary considerations eventually need to drift over into the pack for their committee so we may be an ad hoc committee i may vote yes for that today in all the, in order to, to better understand what finances we're talking about what insurance is what our annual commitment is or is not and, uh, but as far as uh, determining whether we're going to charge, you know, uh, a metric a dollar per metric unit of water, whatever, those things are, are far away from what we need, I think, what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is a very general conceptual idea of, of how we're going to move forward in very general terms. Is that correct? Uh, Chairman, that, that is correct. Really what we'd like to do is just get a couple of board members we could talk to and tell them what are the actual legal options you have to to start heading down a funding source right. not not to propose one not to set rates or anything but to tell you what framework what the what the bookends are of what we're going to be able to work with in the coming months right. thanks <laughs> and i think we need to do that any other comments about funding before we move over to commander longbottom yes sir if i could just clarify mr chair on, on the item agenda item number nine indicates staff encourages board discussion um, there's not a specific recommendation in this item for forming the ad hoc committee today. So I just wanted to clarify that we're just discussing providing potential direction for the next meeting. Is that what your staff is asking for? It would be preferable, Chair, if, um, Chairman Gleason, if the ad hoc committee was formed today. So with the holiday in that, we could get working. But if you didn't want to and you wanted to push it to January, you could. The problem we have is timelines. And, and I don't mean GSP timelines, GSA timelines. I mean timelines associated with Prop 218 and those issues. The longer we wait, the narrower our options legally become on what we can do. Uh, so this was really to try to get out and to, to get us out ahead of the game because I don't want you at the end to not have a legal option that you otherwise would have had because time ran out. Mr. Chair, just if, if I could indulge, um, my, pre my preference would be then that in the future, if, if the staff's intent is they want us to act on something, that the agenda item should indicate that for the public so that they know that coming here that we're going to be approving something as opposed to just discussing something. So somewhere in the agenda it says action required. Right. Yeah, because right, right now it says recommendation, staff encourages board discussion. So if a member of the public read this, um, if I wasn't on this you know, a gentleman of the public, I would think I'm coming just to hear us discussing the possibility yep. of this not actually approving it. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. 
I have uh, assured the City Council that I will bring to them every item we are going to act upon so they can give me their direction and I can make a vote. Without this, I yep. cannot do that. Yep. I agree. Good point. Thank you, Mr. Page. Any following comments? We've had a real good conversation. A real good discussion. <laughs> Okay, the public hearing's been closed. Um, we're over you, I think. I think we were kind of like quietly in agreement that we're going to do something here, but do you want to talk, Mr. I mean, Commander Longbottom? Absolutely. Just real quick, Mr. Chairman, or through the chair, Alan, just a, a quick question. Looking down the road, um, in January 2017, we're talking appointing PAC committee members, so I assume that will occur at our next meeting in uh, mid January. So we did a, we have the uh, application and the process established today. I, I think we, we probably have two things we, we still need to address today in order to move that forward. One would be what's the due date for the application. Uh, the second would be how do we, as folks that aren't submitting an application, um, whether it's the voting members, the non-voting members, the uh, agriculture entities that have already been established, how does their name get into so that when we come to the board next meeting we have names, packages, everything ready to go to have a productive uh, uh, nomination voting process. That's it. <clears throat> With regard to, um, we, can, we can tell you right now if you'd like, um, um, we can give you some deadlines that, that staff would recommend. You know, we could get the information out right away. We have an interested parties list. We, this will be covered in the newspaper. We could send out that application right away and give them a deadline. Uh, my thought would be, given the holidays, um, oh, jump in, please. you mind? Yeah, please. You, you know, it occurs to me that um, we're still working on the bylaws and the charter. So I think just a logical critical path here would be we probably should do the bylaws and the charter first, then at a subsequent meeting make the appointments because that those will guide your decisions on the appointments. So I, w I would recommend that we hold the appointments off till February with the idea that we're going to get the bylaws and the, the charter approved in January. We, could, could we still open up the process and then just yeah yeah let, we start let, collecting the applications? I'm, so I'm saying don't make the appointments until then. Mr. Hall, your thoughts about that? I, I think that sounds good too. I mean, some appointments we. Those being the staff level that the general members could obviously appoint in January, but I think until you have the actual developed and adopted bylaws and charter for the PAC, whether it be included in the bylaws or just referenced, um, you, you might not want to start completely forming and all of your appointments to those committees until that's done. Thank you, sir. Any other thoughts? Okay, staff is looking for a recommendation. The recommendation by staff is to... Uh, Receive and file. We've had conversations. Staff encourages board discussion. So I'm looking for a motion to have discussion. <laughs> receive and file. I'm looking for a motion to receive and file item nine, uh, report on projects and objectives of the IWBGA. And I will move that we receive and file. Is it appropriate also, um, Mr. Chair, for us to direct that at the next meeting we come back with a recommendation on these two items? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I think okay. direct staff to, to come back with a, a specific recommendation on the ad hoc committee, finance committee. Um, and will you be ready to provide a recommendation on special counsel or just a report on special counsel? It'll be a report most likely. Okay. And, a, and an updated report on special counsel at the January meeting. That's my motion. We have a motion. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you, Mr. Page, for your input on that. Closing comments, item 10. Any closing comments by anybody from the board? As usual, I have a couple. Do you have a couple? Yeah. Um, I know we talk about it from time to time, um, but I do want to thank Kern County for um, yes. for providing all the seed money. And seed money is kind of an understatement for all the money that they put into this, considering you know, your budget. So I just want to thank you from, from us at the Indian Wells Valley Water District for of uh, front loading this whole um, event and, and making and getting us this far. I know it was is very expensive and we've been talking a long time and and, uh, and it's very it's welcome um, with all of us because we all have those kind of budgets but uh, you guys led the charge and you guys funded it 
and uh, it, it's totally noticed and totally appreciated. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Okay, a couple real quick ones. Uh, I wanted to thank staff. I think it's getting better. Uh, uh, this is this meeting is better than the last meeting is better than the last meeting. So I'm appreciative of all the work that the whole staff, not just county, but everybody's staff, is putting into this. I know communications is a bear, and you're getting better at it. The workshop that we talked about, process workshop that's coming up. Do you have a date for that, and we're still working on that? We don't have a date for it. Uh, we talked okay. about it on a call the other day. Um, we're it's going to be before the next meeting. Um, we the holidays kind of we're, we're, we're debating it right got now. It. Got it. I wanted to thank uh, the Navy for uh, the I don't know how much money you spent on this, probably a bunch, but it's a uh, significant event because it gives us an opportunity to use this study to get to know this study and to use it possibly as a modeling concept for steps and actions we take moving forward. So, this is a critical component of our success and. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to thank the Navy for their contributions. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, I mean, we've said it many times. We're part of this community. We're part of this team. And I think it's our role today um, to help bridge the gap while we're trying to get everything established and getting the funding, you know, associated and, and pulled together. Uh, we have the funds available, and we're absolutely going to continue co to contribute as we can. Thank you, Commander. Um, Finally, I have a letter, and I want to read it publicly so that people have an understanding of what's going, what's happening. And it's from um, Kernco Home and Farm LLC in Wasco, California. And it's to the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority, attention Mick Gleason, chairman of the board, and the subject line is the Fremont Valley Recovery Project. Dear Mr. Gleason, Kernco Home and Farm Water LLC is proposing a water recovery, storage, transportation, distribution, and sale project which could provide up to 12,500 acre feet per year of new imported supplemental water to the Indian Wells Valley Water ground ba Groundwater Basin. We would like to present this project to the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority for its review and consideration. If possible, please add us to the agenda for the authority's first meeting in 2017, which we understand will occur on or about uh, January 19th of that year. Thank you for your cooperation. Signed, Cecilia Keith God, and Managing Partner. So uh, we're going to agendize this, and we're going to invite uh, Ms. Kernco Home and Farm Water to talk to us about this idea of importing water and uh, the possibility of importing water and uh, we're going to give us at a, the ground level the ability for the public to get involved and get informed all at the same time about uh, what this is all about. So that'll be on so tell your friends and neighbors to come on in January's meeting. It'll be an important one. Any other items? Am I missing anything? Anybody? Are we good to go? I think we're good to go. Okay, the date and time of the next uh, meeting is January 19th, 2017 at 10 a.m. And I'm looking for a uh, Do we have a closed session item? No closed session items. So I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.